So hello all. Welcome to the lecture of Philosophy Against War featuring speakers Professor Nassim Narozi and Dr. Linda Martine Elkoff. My name is Celine van de Mortel. Um, I'm an undergraduate third year philosophy student at Concordia University, Montreal. I organized this event along with the speakers on behalf of the Philosophy Students Association Inclusivity Project. Um, it was originally planned for March 2020, but due to the pandemic was postponed to today. Um, I would first like to thank everyone for coming. As the pandemic nears its first birthday, our bodies and mind are hitting the wall of sheer exhaustion. I know, and so I know from personal experience that engaging with Zoom um, and philosophical lectures may be uh, more difficult and exhausting than ever. So again, thank you to all who are taking the time to join us today. Um, the brief structure of the talk will include a short introduction on the topic and the speakers by myself. Um, next, Dr. Alkoff will speak, fo followed by Professor Narozi. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Um, if you have a question you would like to ask the speakers, uh, please send the questions to me through the chat first. Uh, we're doing this for security purposes. Um, and when you send the questions, you can specify if you would like me to read them out loud, anonymously or not, or uh, if you would like to ask the questions yourself. Uh, and the questions will be on a first come first serve basis. So during the talk, you can message me and I'll mark down your name and the question. Um, and just make sure to remember to specify whether you uh, would like to say it yourself or not. Thank you. So for the speakers, um, Nassim Narozi is a visiting lecturer at Concordia University's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She is trained in philosophy education. Her research focuses on ethics of resistance in today's colonial context. Her work specifically examines the relationship of the phenomena of time, colonization, and resistances against it. Linda Martine Alkoff is a philosopher and professor at Hunter College in New York. Her research interests include feminism, decolonial theory, race theory, continental philosophy, and epistemology. Her latest book, Rape and Resistance, Understanding the Complexities of Sexual Violation, was published in 2018. From 2012 to 2013, Dr. Alkoff was president of the American Philosophical Association. Um, and now here's a short lecture to the, a short introduction to the lecture. Um, so knowledge dissemination or public engagement can initially bring to mind associations of phenomena like advance, advancement of literacy, uh, promoting thinking, and extending the, the, the scope of thoughtfulness to the public sphere. Um, the idea of public engagement in particular, at least at first glance, exudes a, an essence of uh, appreciation and admirability from the public. Rarely do the initial thoughts of public engagement encompass notions of precarity, smear campaigns, uh, death threats, the risks of losing jobs, psychological distress and suffering, bullying, uh, and constant harassments online or in person by certain sectors of this very public or by funded organizations opposed to the knowledge that is being engaged with. Sorry. To say the least, the former associations were what the panelists had in mind when they committed to public philosophical engagement, but the experience they have undergone substantiate the latter ones. Um, I would like to add a few words on what I believe is the importance of these kinds of conversations, especially for young people like me who are only beginning to become familiar with the world of academia. The classic question any philosophy student will receive at a party or from family gatherings is, why study philosophy? What are you gonna do with that? Why didn't you uh, go to John Molson School of Business? And I have to say, this is a question I ask myself often. What do I do with philosophy? How do I transfer theory into practice? What is the point of reading about ethics if we're not learning to integrate it? What are these papers on Kant's transcendental subject going to bring me in the quote unquote real world? There are many answers, many possibilities to answer this question. But the one I find most pertinent uh, and most important and what keeps me motivated and going um, is that philosophy and the humanities uh, let us develop the necessary critical thinking, especially in a world slowly detaching itself from its own roots. In a time of pandemic, growing white supremacy, uh, virtualization of everything, war and ecological crisis, uh, the only recourse we have is our relationship with the world and with others and learning to navigate this fluidity of these relationships is what philosophy can bring us. 
The smear campaigning and aggression thinkers like Professor Neruzzi and Dr. Elkoff experienced through their work illustrates the necessity for philosophy to persevere and for students like myself to hold spaces and talk about these issues we may face as progressive thinkers. I hope this conversation will not only bring light to the danger of writing and producing works about social justice, but also invigorate each one of us to push harder, further, and come together collectively to fight back against these aggressions. I hope academic institutions will become more sensitive to the violence, violence faced by progressive thinkers and will stop leaving this conversation in the shadows and let it emerge as itself a force against the growing hatred we are dedicated to fight. Thank you again to everyone who's joining us. And without further ado, I welcome Dr. Linda Martin Alcoff to speak. Thank you, Celine. Um, thanks for those opening remarks. I mean, if you study the history of philosophy, of real world philosophy, you know that philosophy has often been dangerous. Many philosophers have been targeted, um, assassinated, executed. So there is something th that's an indication of the power and the importance and relevance of philosophy, um, despite what some people think that it's just uh, um, navel gazing, it's actually very dangerous because it's questioning. I, I also want to, before I begin, thank um, Jose Alcoff, who has helped me to prepare these remarks this morning and really to think through the issues of living through this in a politically smart way on a daily basis. And he also gives me a lot of emotional support on a daily basis. And you need that when you're going through this. Um, and I'd like to, to also really thank Nassim Naruzi who, who invited me into this. She's really provided a, a model and an inspiration of resistance um, as we will see today. And, and also philosophical analysis, right? I mean, they're, they're, this is a political issue, but it's, but it's also a philosophical and an intellectual issue that, that, that requires and merits some, some analysis. So I, I appreciate her solidarity. She and I have also created a little network of solidarity that's been very important for me. L let me just give you a little bit of, of words before I get into the phenomenology part about my own situation, for those of you who may not know. It actually began some decades ago when I was a young person doing anti-Klan activism and some union activism in the South. Um, uh, <laughs> I, we got anonymous threatening letters, some phone calls, um, serious enough that a friend of ours decided we needed to have a rifle. So he, he bought one for us and showed us how to use it, sort of. Um, and then later when I began to publish works on whiteness after I um, became a faculty member, I, you know, got some more threatening uh, letters and phone calls. And then I gave a talk on anti-Latino racism and an ultra-right news outlet that's under, that's, that's connected to Tucker Carlson on Fox News. It's called The Daily Caller. And they had planted somebody in my talk and they spread a real smear mischaracterization of what I said. And I think they were really designed, it was really targeting my institution. They wanted to shame the City University of New York. So we had to get the lawyers involved, but the lawyers at CUNY counseled doing nothing because they didn't want to give the story steam. And that's often the kind of advice that we get from our institutions, which we can, we can think about and talk about. But then what happened was about two years ago, things got much worse as my younger son, Jose, um, threw fire from some white nationalists for his anti-fascist activism. The whole family was doxxed, you know, in which they, they got all of our information, including my grandchildren. And he and I became the primary targets of persistent and ugly physical threats, which in my case extended to sending harassing messages to my colleagues, to my department chair, to my dean, to my provost, to my university president, urging that I be fired. And similar emails went out to workplaces of other family members. Then the situation took a turn for the worse when uh, my son, was the victim of false testimony in a case that was used to charge him with 10 felony counts, including a terrorism charge, which helped him, uh, which caused him to lose his housing 
his job and any semblance of normalcy in his life, given that he's been blacklisted from employment and placed publicly on the terror watch list, even though he has, there's just a charge. He hasn't been to court, it hasn't, he hasn't been convicted yet, and yet he's on the terror watch list now and is facing serious prison time. Our whole family has been affected, leading to the need for safety precautions. Um, so that's why I'm here today. We're, we're very much still in the middle of it, as is Nassim. Um, fortunately, I can say that many of the efforts of our harassers have been ill-conceived and poorly executed. They don't always get their facts right in any stretch, but they've been serious enough to seriously upend our lives. Okay, so the, the Trinidadian philosopher Chris Thiele um, has described the way in which colonial violence operates in the sphere of temporality, the phenomenological concept of temporality, which is the, the everyday experience of the present, past, and future. And this, this phenomenological approach to temporality is meant to acknowledge that the lived experience of time is not discrete units divided equally without variation in significance or meaningfulness. So temporality is used to distinguish from time, not because temporality is less basic than time, but because it's actually more basic. It's closer to experience. It's immediately intuited when described. The concept of time as discrete and equal units is a useful construct, but it's built upon a kind of alienation of human experience. And since Einstein, we've known that this conceptualization of time is actually not objective, universal, or uniformly useful across the domain of astronomical inquiry. So then the effect of coloniality is not to disrupt the uniformity of time, but to dismantle the present and future as lived by the targets of slavery, genocide, war, and land annexation. There is a disassembling, as Chris puts it, of the present and future, along with a disassembling of one's spatial habitat. The normal organizations of planning, hopeful anticipation, expectations of regularity, even the comfort of monotony disappear and are replaced by the ever-present background noise of anticipated catastrophe. I have found this useful for considering the phenomenology of amorphous threats. The present becomes attenuated, shortened, when it is subject to perpetual and radical disruption. Um, the present becomes attenuated in size, the future alters its form to a nebulous worry, the future can no longer be anticipated, planned, or imagined with pleasure. Best not to think about the future at all. How then does one craft a sense of safety sufficient to function within the present or toward the future? Almost any attempt to create safety for oneself or one's loved ones renders us complicit with those who wish to torment us. We circumscribe our behavior, the spatial freedoms of our children, our and their engagement with social media, devising new rules for ordinary living. We become, in Foucaultian terms, our own prison guards, enforcing our own and our family's isolation, educating them in fearful modes of living. A semblance of safety seems only to be found in constrictions of our space, our movement, our communication, and our sociality. And I think those who haven't experienced this kind of amorphous threats might imagine that you should be able to simply shake it off, shake off the effects, live life as before, ignore the static. But there is no simple escape from the threatening gaze. And the amorphousness, of course, is part of what makes it um, ever present. That does not mean, however, that there is no possibility of resistance. 
new lines of critical social analysis become visible from this space. One goes to one's local institutions for help, as I have, those institutions that are identified as being in the business of providing security to their employees, their citizens, their inhabitants of the city. And we find that they can provide no security, meaning that they will not. I alerted my institution of the death and rape threats I was getting in my university email. I showed them examples and they informed me that I'd have to actually incur physical harm before anything could be done. But they said I should keep a record of these messages so that an investigation could happen subsequently if I was in fact murdered. The provision of security for our lives and possessions is the grounding rationale of the social contract imagined by modern liberal theory. We supposedly exchange a significant portion of personal liberty in order to gain the security the government provides us in living amongst others. But if there is no security from others, as there is not for women in general in our societies, for minority religious groups, for racialized groups, even for those inhabiting highly secured and heavily monitored institutions such as prisons, detention centers, halfway houses, homeless shelters, and so on. If there is no security for this rather large constituency, then what is the social contract in reality? What legitimates our security institutions if they do not provide security? What exactly are they engaged in? So perhaps it is the case that staying in the moment, even in an attenuated, diminished present, can be an interesting vantage point, a way to enliven our ability to formulate non-ideal theories about how our societies actually operate. This vantage point also makes apparent the opportunity for solidarity across a variety of diverse groups who have never felt the protection of institutionalized security. It gives us a new perspectival standpoint, a point zero, from which to fashion new conceptions of life. And it requires some new thinking about security and how to understand it. Expanding the existing security measures to these persistently vulnerable groups does not work. In other words, taking the ways in which we do security for a few and then trying to expand them to the rest, I'm arguing, doesn't work. What works for the dominant will not work for the non-dominant. Gated communities can exacerbate domestic violence. Militarized police forces render more of the population into enemy combatants or looking like enemy combatants from the perspective of a rifle scope. Proliferating arms can lead to proliferating threats. The basic problem with social contract theory is placing security in the institutions of the state, cordoning off the power to surveil, discipline, and punish from the population at large. What would it mean to make security a communal practice? Let me get at this question by rethinking the source of amorphous threats. The philosopher of liberation, Enrique Dussel, has argued that the test of an ethical theory, as well as the ways in which we should judge our social and political institutions, revolves around the question of life. Do, does our society, do our institutions allow the flourishing of life? But in his important correction to the mainstream modern European view here, for do so, life is defined as communal life. This means the question is not, can individuals survive and flourish? But can communities survive and flourish? Especially he's thinking of those communities that have or had prior to colonial incursions, functioning socially crafted ecosystems for social reproduction. He's thinking especially of the many indigenous groups who were thriving prior to the conquest, able to provide sufficient food, housing, and education for all before they were disassembled 
and transformed into landless workers. Insecurity of basic sustenance was produced by colonial reorganization. So Dussel names this focus on life that he gives us the material principle, the right, which is the right of community regeneration. And it's the center of his philosophy of education as explained in, in the recently published short book, Pedagogics of Liberation, for which I wrote a lengthy introduction that summarizes his approach. We can also apply this material principle to the long century and a half of anti-Black violence that occurred since the end of Reconstruction after the Civil War um, in the 1860s throughout the United States. This violence did not merely target Black individuals, but it was targeted at businesses, at neighborhoods, homes, and churches that were burned to the ground in Tulsa, Rosewood, Valdosta, Chicago, city after city after city. Um, the point was deterrence, to instill such pessimism in the community that rebuilding would not happen, to target the hard-won collective mechanisms built after slavery, to create community survival and uplift. Destroying businesses and property was a way of ensuring that Black people could only survive by accepting the employment conditions offered by white employers, that they would have no option but to become landless workers. So this, this form of violence really does fit the definition of terror, focused because it was focused not on specific individuals, but on a group people, a form of community, a form of communal life. The real target was the mass, their behavior, their options, their possibilities. And this is the real target of the violence Nassim and I and so many others are experiencing. Amorphous threats alter the choice structure of whole identity groups and social movements, changing likely outcomes and hence changing our motivations and our plans, creating a sense of permanent, inevitable, ineradicable vulnerability and precarity. My students have often asked me how they can work on certain topics. They want to work on, you know, these kinds of topics, but they don't want to incur the, this kind of effect on their lives. They're already, prior to even entering the profession, calculating their choices, assuming the likelihood of serious threats as an inevitable condition. So just to, to conclude here, I want to return to the question of the state, which is the question of the source of amorphous threats. Um, how amorphous, I guess, is the source of these threats in reality? And I want to suggest not really. The terrorist violence that beset African American communities throughout the 20th century, um, unfortunately, has not stopped in the 21st century entirely. That, that it was perpetrated often by whites without official sanction, right? So it was often perpetrated not by police forces, but by um, what we sometimes today, I think, mistakenly call fringe groups. At least sanction uh, was not publicly known or publicly made visible all the time. C.P. Ellis, who was the former Grand Cyclops of the Ku Klux Klan in Durham, North Carolina, and, and he was a very, him, himself a very low status working man, he was thrilled, as he recounted later, to get phone calls at his home from the sheriff, from members of the city council, from local officials and elected politicians who you know, would not say hi to him in the street, but would call him up to make sure he and his clan brothers would have inside knowledge of the activities of the police forces in Durham, um, called by police surveillance and civil, on civil rights organizations in Durham. They wanted also to offer Ellis encouragement for the intimidating activities that the Klan was carrying out during the civil rights movement. The best term for this sort of activity, I think, is the term coined in Latin America, paramilitaries. 
paramilitaries are armed and violent organized groups that are aligned with states, mm -hmm. but they're able to carry out ostensibly independent acts that provide the state an alibi. States can claim not to know, not to be able to control them, that the laws of the country disallow this kind of violence, mm -hmm. that the violence is brought on by the victims for having the temerity to resist land annexation and maintain communal life, refusing to cooperate in countries like Colombia, for example, with narco trafficking gangs or developers with foreign money. In the United States, the Ku Klux Klan operated very much like the paramilitaries of Latin America. Although some elected officials and officers of the state were clandestine members of the Klan, and sometimes their clandestine membership was widely known about in both the black and white communities, the newspapers would cover Klan violence when they covered it at all, as if it was an unruly mob, not organized from above, not assisted from above, not orchestrated or sanctioned by the local government in any way. And this is what's continuing to happen in the United States in light of the violence in uh on january 6th at, in the in the u.s capitol it is still being portrayed in the mainstream liberal media as fringe as extremism as entirely separate and independent of state activity so to conclude then i i just want to make the point that although these threats are experienced phenomenologically as amorphous because they're anonymous, because they can come from anywhere at any time. They're not in actuality amorphous. The inability of the state to control and discipline the unruly mob outside its bounds is a, you know, as if the, the type of clan violence is an unruly mob. This is a false picture. The fascists operating in many societies are not fringe. They're not even extremists. They're part of the apparatus by which existing structures of power and resource distribution are protected. Thanks very much. Look forward to the Q&A later. Thank you very much. Um, would we like to take a five minute break? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I, in during the break, thank you very much, Linda. I started taking notes and I thought that, you know, one small page would suffice. And then I realized that everything is filled. And <laughs> after a while, I'm just going to try to remember it. Um, sure, I just provided a very awkward handout for people. Um, and you know, I start. We, it is it is an idiosyncratic one, but because I'm covering a few things that might be a little bit alien to other people, it's it's a it's a good idea if you want to look over it when I'm reading from my talk. Um, and I, uh, I I have some questions I want to ask Linda later, but um, let me start by actually saying that this is this is maybe weird and embarrassing, but I have this dream that I'm giving a talk at an event commemorating Linda Alkoff's work. And only there will I say how her public engagement has been so dangerous to mainstream thoughts and you know, mainstream thoughts that promote agendas of war and injustice and how liberatory and critical her presence is. So um, I'll leave that for then. For now, there are no words that will describe my gratitude to her for being um, this much supportive throughout these difficult times. Um, I will also want to mention that we lost um, a very um, a sweetheart of football player recently due to COVID um, in times of a pandemic. Uh, I do want to start with his memory. Uh, his name is uh, Ali Ansarian. Um, and also reiterate that a withholding to lift sanctions in times of a pandemic is um, a contribution to a silent genocide. Um, another comrade of mine that I want to uh, thank before starting my, my talk is Khashayar, a very good friend of mine who 
um, helped me in all sorts of ways online when smears were going unhinged. Without him, I wouldn't have survived. So I, I would like to thank him. So Lean, thank you so much for taking up this opportunity, like this cha challenge. I know it was hard. I know we had to do a lot of arrangements, but I'm glad we finally made it into sort of talking about this, I think for a first time discussing philosophy against Tuar. Um, now, uh, I, I did want to cover in this talk that I'm giving at Concordia. Um, I, the second part of my talk wanted to focus on a birth of a new fallacy with regards to war, but we don't have time for that. So maybe later on as a, a you know, follow-up talk, we're gonna talk about how a, fall, a specific fallacy that is leading to war. Um, before starting, I just wanna say that I'm using many words in many new ways, not trying to be difficult, nor trying to make something sound sophisticated. We're trying to lean on words here to describe a phenomenon that I feel like we still haven't processed it fully as a community. So, you know, I hope the outline will help, but I think the newness of the phenomena and it being related to the Iranian community in particular can make it initially a bit alienating. So do a look at the, uh, look at the uh, outline for that. Um, just to give you a bit of a few examples about the kind of threats we receive. Um, these are in Farsi, but I'm sure I can um, translate very quickly in two minutes. I'll share the screen with you to see, um, and I'll start with I'll start with uh, Linda's um, the thread that Linda received, and these are sometimes the late night messages that we we talk about. Um, so this is this uh, Linda. Do you want to talk about this? This is one of the interesting smart ones um, threats that you've received. Yeah, this was a new one for us, uh, just to make it a little different. This is a postcard sent to my home address, which is attempting to implicate me in a crime. It says, we really stuck it to the man. Did you see all the tagging? We did. Tagging is graffiti um, writing. We broke enough windows to, f he, and it's saying we, as if like, I was part of this. We broke enough windows to fill a landfill. We looted six different stores. Can't wait for the next riot. Black Lives Matter. Uh, so, you know, it's just, it was interesting. Uh, they are always coming up with new methods. I, I find it very interesting because they, it is, they are very smart. And I talk about smear campaigns. They create something out of nothing and that's the evil part of it. But, you know, um, this is one example of the harassments I receive online. Here, um, the person has written, just like how, just like how we reported you to, to, uh, reported to your university to have you fired, we're following up on deporting you from the US, the guy thinks I'm in the US, it has gotten to good places. So, you know, they're sort of telling me that um, my name is being shared with the intelligence agencies. This is um, at, the t at the height of a smear campaign where they just, I think they Googled Burnett short hair and they found this and Jaguar. And then they, they, they say that this is a picture of me saying that I am in a Jaguar in Montreal. Um, I'm selling people's, uh, you know, with, with the people's money because they want to relate me to the government. Uh, I'm, you know, cruising the town with my Jaguar. Um, and why are you guys uh, protesting against me having fired? So you have to have Nassim fired. This is another one, which is one of my favorites. They have actually pasted a logo of the Islamic Republic on my gap uh, uh, <laughs> quote uh, that says Nassim is a, a lobbyist for and a mercenary for the Islamic Republic in Canada. And the way I, I received this, this is from a, um, a like a website. And um, I was telling this to Linda and Soline that my dental hygienist sent this to me, worried, like, are you a mercenary? So, you know, these do work. Um, this is another campaign. It's a slander that says, all right, Nassim has been fired from Concordia. And then people write, oh, is that true? And then here it says, if you see in the third slide, you can see the word education. He has written, I have contacted one of her colleagues, anonymous in the Department of Education, who uh, has suggested that this will be taken to the Ministry of Higher Education in Quebec. Um, and her news was that if you keep writing and pressuring to have her fired, it will work. Um, this is another message uh, that was circulated amongst Concordia students, Iranian groups that says they have T taken a tweet of mine, mistranslated it, um, you know, it's a t taken it out of context and written that I am a regime apologist and sympathizer. Um, so, you know, um, 
these are some of the stuff that I wanted to share with you because um, you might get an idea about what we're talking about. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna admit that's my mom, Celine. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I, I, yeah. So I, sure. Okay. So um, what you see in my outline that I actually start with the limitations of my argument because the oversimplified presence. I want to mention a few caveats. The oversimplified presence of Socrates in my work is almost criminal. Um, I despise this Hollywood image that is out there about Socrates, but you know, um, I, I had to bring it to show the historical precedents in order to draw attention to the importance of public engagement and the danger of it. Um, there are no comparisons here also between whatever I'm saying and sort of the historical precedents, like I'm not comparing myself to any other philosopher in any way, just comparing the trend of smear. So no assumption of self-grandiosity on my part. I also know that I'm using the word sophist in its primary and problematic modern usage, which is the, as the dishonest argumentative trickster, knowing how this blanket term, as Taylor and Lee remind us, considerably distorts what can be recovered from historical reality, uh, recovered of the historical reality. So, you know, I know that so Socrates is called a sophist himself. So, you know, with all that caveat, we're gonna start. One of the alternative titles of this talk, my talk was Liberatory Composures, but one of the alternative titles of this talk was On the Hemlock That No Longer Is. In order to elaborate on this almost chosen title, I have to provide a bit of a context. Two years ago, as someone in philosophy of education, I decided to have what can be best described as a public engagement. However, this was not just any public, it was an exploited one. I say an exploited public, since it had been fed and is being fed opaque concepts and reasonings for a long time. A divided public, one constantly wrestling with inflation, instability, and with the shadow of yet another war looming, all justified internally and externally through obscure reasonings, murky arguments, and unexamined concepts. From the inside, there exists a systemic interpretation on why things are the way they are, quite often violent, dark, and unstable. Uh, an inter interpretation mainly nourished by a deferral of shortcomings to the outside of this geography, to imperialism, to the West, to capitalism, etc. Shortcomings are deferred to this outside, to this outside that while continually being demonized, keeps flaunting its capital-based charm and commodified charm through foreign-funded opposition satellite channels. Problems are deferred to this outside that embodies a sense of irresistible charm that further flickers every once in a while through the souvenirs and gifts that those who travel or immigrate to that outside or to the West present to this sanctioned public. I'm talking about the Iranian nation. Opacity in reasonings is dispatched even more systemically from outside of this geography to this public. By presenting sanctions as a remedial gift offered to this nation um, for the very dire, for the very violent, dark, and unstable existences they go through. The West demonizes the Iranian government and its human rights or women's rights abuses, sanction people or offer sanctions as remedial gifts to save the people from internal authoritarianism. While in fact, the Iranian experience in the past 60 years after the nationalization of oil, way before the Islamic revolution, corroborates the idea that sanctions are in one way a, repr a reprimanding measure for refusing to allow your resources to become for others. Let's not forget that countries in the Middle East whose oil was never nationalized have never been sanctioned for any violation of human rights or for the darkness or instability their people go through. We will see why I have named all of these and named them as opacities. To see the systemic opacity behind concepts of sanctioning for human rights, it suffices to recall how James Rickards, an American expert on gold speculation, on matters on finance, finance and on precious metals, substantiates the reasoning behind this idea of sanctions. I can refer to his book, but I choose to go with his speech, probably mainly because I haven't read his book, in which he, with the most civil sounding composed rhetoric, demonstrates how, if the US wants to alter the behavior of a rival government, it ratchets up sanctions against them. Sometimes 
it decides, he boasts, to go for the jugular, like cutting the central bank of Iran out of the global financial system. He argues how the business that deal with the U.S. as a sanctioning entity do not, the businesses that deal with the U.S. as the sanctioning entity do not need to be told twice as they do not want to face not doing business with a sanctioner. One has to admit his, that his straightforwardness in expounding on the opacity is admirable. He recounts how cutting the access of the central bank results in an instantaneous and a 40% drop of currency in one day. What happens next can be anticipated, he recounts. A lot of what is sold is imported. You need dollars to pay. If your currency goes down 40%, you need twice as many dollars. So the sanctioned entity has to double the national currency. This expert on gold and precious metals human is giving a lecture standing behind a podium in front of a media wall that has the phrase ethics matter written all over it. Dramatizing his reflections further, he continues, we are injecting inflation into their economy. And the fact that their election is coming up is interesting, whether this creates more dissent or not. He goes on, Infl inflation is a powerful motivator of popular discontent and in social unrest. It's a good way to destabilize a regime. Halfway through his talk, the human expert sounds almost patriotic and celebratory. He says, we gained it. We gained it in 2009, and there was a big worry about inflation, thanks to the chairman of our Federal Reserves. As if Rickards, the author of Currency Wars, and an expert in advising smoother access to resources that are not his countries, is teaching us that while social unrest might in appearance hint at a liberatory drive for the human, the justice, freedom, human rights, for example, engineering of it through sanctions is for the sake of an eventual access to resources that are not ours. By modifying or changing an undesired behavior or governance of those who, with all the darkness they create, are nonetheless and for some reason not budging to this outside. All of these points can be overlooked if one does not unpack the opaque reasoning behind the U.S.'s imposition of sanction. I wonder if one wants to translate the reasoning of these castigating measures from outside and under the name of human rights and freedom, all legitimate causes and worries, by the way. It can be the following. In exchange for your geography and its resources, we will give you our all-inclusive concept of the human and his rights. All of this, regardless of the amount of irreparable damage and destruction it will take to never get this idea of human rights right. I'm thinking about Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and et cetera. All right, so my public engagement that I was talking about in the background I was saying was a two hour long unpacking of such systemic opacities with respect to a specific cause. It was a phenomenology of pinkwashing which can be defined as promoting or taking over of liberatory movements, human rights, LGBTQ rights, or women's rights movements of some countries by other states, often to advance, cloak, and legitimize regressive measures. So through putting different pieces of the problematic together, the talk identified how seemingly abstract concepts of human and women's rights can in actuality become justificatory code words for hostilities towards and interventions in countries that have land and resources. Expansionisms does that pose themselves as bloodless and clean starting overs and as alternatives to the dysfunctioning forms of governance on the ground. With a historical example of the Iraqi women who stood shoulder to shoulder with the US Army and President Bush to call for human rights and women's freedom and thus legitimize their dreams for a dignified future of the Iraqi humans and women, the talk illustrated how the secular days they were longing for not only did not materialize, it even made women further gravitate towards religion because of the instabilities caused through war. I knew who the public was, having been from this very public and acknowledged their unexplainable, severe longings to become like the ones who are penalizing them, their Eurocentrism um, or cognitive imperialism. 
their arguments, the arguments of my talk, the pace of presenting, and the nature of the talk were thus arranged accordingly. Liberatory concepts were examined, their relations to the centers that hire fellows to create policies under the guise of such concepts were looked into. Countries and special interest groups behind promoting these concepts were also expanded on. The talk then focused on why we fall for such opacities and arrangements. We examined the ideas with which we carry ourselves in the world that make us not see the interests of humans in other geographies other than their own. We discussed the tradesmanship behind, and the economy behind opaque concepts. So what, posed, what earlier posed as an innocent advocacies representing genuine longings for justice, for the human, women, and their rights could now be seen as a denseness that was ready to be packaged and be sent to the sanctioned geography in exchange for resources or modification of behavior of those humans. Now, people had written about this before in better ways and in more complex ways, for sure. But the talk committed to tailoring this unpacking for a public previously touched upon. I will name this modality of engagement a liberatory composure. And by that, I mean an arranging of reasonings so that it would be impossible to see things like before, an undoing of opacity. A few weeks later, after this talk, a 10 minute video uh, interview about the talk with a grassroots organization went viral. And in two days, overall, I think it gained about 100K viewership. Pinkwashing and my name became hashtags with all the ensuing shenanigans, the sexually profane and derogatory insults, the online bullying of the trolls, um, the weird competitions, uh, competitive attitudes of other people in this field, etc. One should have predicted that the tradesmen of opacity would be unhappy and would plan a smear campaign. I didn't, but I should have. An online bickering with a person, a human rights lawyer funded by other geographies other than Iran, um, was mistranslated to look like a threat to the Iranian opposition. I myself am categorized as a critic or an opposition. But the lawyer initiating, initiating the campaign was himself a fellow in a think tank calling for sanctioning Iran on grounds of women and human rights violations. So he, made a, he created a smear against me. This, these types of campaigns uh, happened at least six more times and still are happening each time before or after a talk. And the latest one was um, on a, for a talk I gave on Saturday. Through burden of proof fallacies, deflections, slanders, and according to a journalist, vicious smears, Ordinary people were also affected and riled up. Before one other talk, hundreds of emails were sent to the university. Email addresses of my colleagues were being distributed online with the content, with the content contact her chair, contact her department colleagues, contact her Facebook friends, write emails to her advisor, and etc. My inbox was filled with threats like, we'll have you fired, motherfucker, and this, let this be a lesson for you. My advisor was receiving such emails till months later. The lawyer, as the chief tradesman of opacity, even asked people to come to my other talks to ask questions based on a fabricated story he helped promote online. The talk had to be given because of the smears with heavy security presence, and after the talk I had to be escorted back to my car because of the threats I was receiving. By the end of every smear campaign, I was left having to prepare arguments for hours and hours on end to show how a nuanced and ethical resistance entails an awareness of the opacity of concepts. Long gone were the days of tranquil, tranquil wrestling with concepts while sipping espressos. The body, there was nothing left of the body or the brain except a lot of fogginess and exhaustion. It is true that the engagement created harshness for me, but this was a two-way unsettlement. Some still process my takes with resentment, but some of the people who watched the video, who till that day had been fed an opaque concept of the human, were now exposed to an idea that no longer transcended borders and cultures and ethnicities, but in a paradigm-shattering way, it was seen as a culprit for imposing of sanctions and instabilities. Some online discussions that ensued later and afterwards allowed arguments to actually breathe amongst these opaque pseudo arguments. People would DM me saying, 
with x, y also comes into light. Or this makes x's claim to be invalid because z. So amongst all those you know, profanities, there were actually arguments that were coming into my mailbox. So one of the fascinating things was that emails were being sent to me from members of the Iranian queer community, women, teenagers, journalists, about how the talk had given them tools to unlearn what they had been taught. It felt like it was hard for the advocates of the opaque concepts to continue their calm and confident tone and, pose, and confident tone and pose when calling for sanctioning Iran on the grounds of human rights. I mean, because, you know, the solution to women's oppression is the imposition of uh, dire financial instabilities. That's going to make them become liberated and more autonomous. Put it differently, the talk disrupted the unchallenged and comfortable anonymity or innocence of liberatory concepts. An anonymity with the help of which an economy of aggression was both being fueled and justified. By anonymity here, I mean an abstracted concept of the concept of the human and his rights, stripped of its birthplace, its history, its creators, its geography, a concept emptied of its ethnic particularities, and in the meantime, presented as capable of transcending beyond its own space and of posing as applicable to other geographies an anonymity which allows a concept to appear as too good to be dirtied by history or politics or particularities. So an undisrupted anonymity would have allowed an economy of aggression to abdicate responsibilities from itself. It would have ignored that the universal concept of human rights has its roots in the humanistic, humanistic turns of the 16th and 17th century in one semi-continent Europe and that it has its moment of conception in the secular distinction between the divine, the human, and the animal world in a very specific geography, Europe. And I'm referring to Nelson Maldonado Torres' thought on this. An anonymity not unsettled would have further blinded one to not to seeing how these distinctions between the European human and God and animals in the same historical period and during the same humanistic turns in other continents contributed to other modes of distinctions and thinking about the human. By imposing itself on interpretations of humans of other geographies, anonymity left thinking with a potent lethal legacy, the idea of man with a particular history, the European man, as becoming the yardstick for thinking about other humans in terms of degrees. Some humans looking less human and some look humans looking more human. Not to also mention how it left us with the legacy of a comparative ethos in thinking and analyzing the new and the unfamiliar. Check this quote for this point that I'm saying. I also happen to think of something that I have observed many times with regards to these Indians. Their skulls are four times thicker than those of the Christians. And so when one wages war with them and comes to hand, comes to hand to hand fighting, one must be careful not to hit them on the head with the sword because I have seen how many swords broken in this fashion. This is what I've talked about, the comparative ethos in thinking and analyzing the new and the unfamiliar. These are the words of Fernandez de Oviedo doing business, smelting gold in a geography other than his in the 16th century, the very century which men from a land far from his geography that we are standing on right now tried offering humanistic remedies according to their conception of the human to those that looked comparatively swine-like and half-beasts. An undisrupted anonymity would not let us see how the, would not have let us see how the educational policy of kill the Indian to save the man of residential schools has the European concept of man first emptied of its particular background and then was offered as the undisputed trajectory for freedom from savagery. Here, savagery being not looking like the human, like the European human. Again, not having disrupted this anonymity would have meant an oblivion to notice how the upgrading of the savage conditions of the human in other spaces mostly happens in geographies with resources. Rich moments of thinking about the human and his freedom, the European Renaissance and Enlightenment, with its tail end being a thinking of human in terms of degrees did after all justify the perception of different zones in the spaces of the world. Lighter zones of civilization that live up to the concept of human and darker zones of salvation with its resources being perceived as being there 
for our sake. Disrupting the anonymity thus meant retrieving the possibility for new and nascent questions about the human and their rights beyond, let's say, the American Declaration of Human Rights, which was written in geographies that were the lands of once free humans before they were labeled the savages, according to a comparative spirit in, think spirit in thinking about new encounters. Adhering to the abstracted and depoliticized concepts of the human and the woman had been forcing the public that I was engaging with to see the human from lands afar solely as humans as thinkers or humans as experts and not the human as the weapons manufacturer or the human as the lobbyist or the human as an advisor to forage precious metals and golds in geographies beyond his own. However, as recalled, such interference with anonymity is precarious. The precarity is for one specific reason, by exposing the denseness, presenting itself as an innocent anonymity, the liberatory reasoning and composure alters the time of the meaning of the concepts like women's rights and human rights. What do I mean by that? When the time of meaning is altered, the future of the meaning and thinking about the meaning is no longer in, is, is no longer in the hands of those who have arrested the time of the concept in a neutral, apolitical and exonerated present. This is perhaps the scariest alteration for a planned and engineered future for the time of concepts. Military invasion was supposed to bring freedom to get the dignity of the people back from their leaders, right? Its density, like this is military invasion of Iraq, let's say, its density was not supposed to be unpacked for people who were being hopeful that this is their ultimate solution and their last resort to become free from their unwanted leaders. Concepts were supposed to remain anonymous and abstract and therefore innocent and nothing but liberatory, not at all tinged with justifying militaristic invasions, for example. Keep this idea of planned and engineered future for time of concepts, I'll come back to it. So when the, when the people, uh, my, the people, uh, audience, the public engagement, when they hear the word human in the phrase human rights, by let's say James Rickards, what comes to their mind is not just the concept of human as in the abstracted idea of European human rights, nor no longer just an innocent human advocating on their behalf, but now they could see the human as the weapons manufacturer. What comes to their mind is not just the abstract idea of freedom as the future of a nation, people living free lives, but the war-torn scenes about freedom operations that have been kick-started by militaries of other nations in the name of freeing the people. An impossibility to see things the way they were before. An undoing of the engineering of the time of concepts. The future meanings of concepts are no longer in the hands of those who comfortably rely we're no longer in the hands of those who comfortably relied on their abstractness to slide their way out of having to be held responsible for the war and suffering they caused by those very abstract concepts. I mean, Bush never said that we're going to invade Iraq because hmm, on second thought they got oil. He said Saddam Hussein is a dictator, which he was, and we need to liberate the people of Iraq. Opaque concepts were not, that were not examined by us gave him a free pass. Now, you're sitting in North America, you think, of course, war is done in the name of human rights. Yeah, sure, this is obvious. What are you talking about? But no, for people who have been constantly dealing with opaque concepts, for people who deal with instabilities that are fabricated for them from inside and outside, remember records, for them, war is a starting over for freedom. The future after war is good. It is a new and clean starting over. This is where the meaning of war and freedom get locked. And imagine the tradesmanship off of this. I mean, I, I also have people living in Iran, you know, they love their country, ready to die for it. They were angry at me, sending messages to me because I had given a speech against war. They were telling me war is good. It will rid us of the situation. We got Iraq right next door. Like it's, it's there for us to see. But opaque concepts have locked the meanings and their times at a comfortable point. Imagine how upsetting it is then to examine the opacity of the concept for, of human rights and women's rights and the wars that are initiated based on them for a public 
that has been wrestling with this opacity. Arranging meanings in a way that it would be impossible to see things like before, liberatory composure. And imagine, again, how detrimental this is to a smooth, composed, confident advancing of aggression into geographies with resources. You know, we do have different modes of being composed, by the way. Pompeo's pretty composed, you know, posture when he says, we're imposing new sanctions on Iran and we're with the Iranian people. This composure was being disrupted by the liberatory composure. And I can see how annoying public engagements in philosophy can be. All right, so if one would juxtapose some recurring concepts and themes of the paper with, an, with one another, the liberatory composure that alter, alters the times of meaning of concepts, the slanders nourished by classic fallacies, and the opaque composure that arrested the time of meanings, one might see that we're not dealing far from the zone of some important philosophical precedents. That is, if we assume sophistry or fallacies as an act of engineering the time of meaning or concept of concepts, or arresting the time of concepts for a particular cause, domination, victory, success, wealth, etc. And then take Socrates' modality of reasoning as premised on an altering or liberating of the time of meanings. One of Socrates' main feats, after all, was how he adjusted the level and type of his questions to the individuals with who he talked, often in the marketplace. And through that, and I'm quoting, he stung, stunned, and confused people into the unpleasant experience of realizing their own ignorance, which I will arrogantly define pedagogy as philosophy par excellence. It could be well this that, that this particular liberatory composure aimed at a particular public for which Socrates was charged and sentenced by sophists that, as Deborah Nails point, point out, came from abroad from other geographies to teach humans how to reach more wealth and fame. Slander is about corrupting the minds of youth, irreverence, and the unsuccessful forbidding of Socrates by a ruling party to speak with men under 30, and the unforgivable crime of hair-splitting twaddle and the ignoring of the craft of tragedians, based on which comedian Aristophanes declared it would no longer be fashionable to associate with Socrates. Slanders that would spread amongst the public and jurors who had susceptibilities, like, you know, the ones who were being fed opacities. They needed to pay and probably did not make fine distinctions between philosophy and sophistry. A public that, by the way, also kept going through endless wars. The Persian invasion during which Socrates was born, the Battle of Delium, a three-decade war with Sparta, long sieges reducing people to cannibalism before people surrendered, Another battle in Spatolus, Yemen, Syria, Iraq. No, I'm, I'm getting off track. One wonders whether the slanders and smears created by those who aspire geographical domination is because a liberatory reasoning is disrupting the innocent anonymity of injustices with war or the rhetoric of war being one of them. And more importantly, whether today's sophists in a geography outside of their own are profiting off of a reliance on and adherences to the anonymity of liberatory concepts to advance into geographies that are not theirs through a deliberate overlooking of the past, present, and future of concepts so that the time of meaning gets arrested at a very comfortable point for executing a plan. One disturbing subsequent question then is as follows. Does this opaque composure as well as the anonymity rely not only on the legacy of sophistry, but on the longstanding assumptions about the depolitical nature of thought that is very common, common and yet is subtly yet potently endorsed in philosophy? I'm referring to Dr. Alcott's reminder about how too many philosophers still operate with depoliticized notions of real philosophy and consider other types of work suspect because they're politically motivated rather than concerned only with the truth. Now I'm almost done. In other words, whether philosophy in terms of its depoliticized stance, yet as a field that is perhaps the only one going back to a specific precarious liberatory composure against the opaque composures and one that has the legacy and the wherewithal to alter the time of meanings is complicit in war, 
by adhering to the notion that philosophical reasoning is generally anonymous, abstract, and depoliticized. Now, I'm not talking about a cushioned political thinking in philosophy, by which I mean and engaging with a reasoning that has already been comprehensively established outside of philosophy, and then it's imported to philosophy, either for receiving accolades or out of risks of outdatedness or irrelevance. In other words, I'm not talking about the disgruntled and hesitant inclusion of politics, for which is for the sake of philosophy or the philosopher, and not nourished by a drive for liberatory composures and altering the time of meanings. It's almost scary if one fathoms how the dominating spirit of the rhetoric of war that presents itself as a liberatory alternative for injustice as afar can be seen as relying on two conflicting traditions, sophistry and its engineering of opacity and time of meanings and concepts, and philosophy and its subtle faith faithfulness to abstraction and anonymity. I need to mention that here fallacies are operating in two different ways. One is through fueling rhetoric of war, like the one I touched upon, and the other is through silencing and smearing anti-war voices. Risking repetition, one can ask the earlier questions in another form, whether precarity and danger and liberatory composures and reasonings are inherently inseparable. Whether the smeared thinker, because of their work and not their tweets, is the genuine philosopher and whether there is an ingrained responsibility for philosophy or philosophy students with respect to, to war as a form of suffering and distance that has proximate profits for people near by, precisely because it is a phenomenon that is fueled by fallacies. What kind of responsibility does that put on our shoulders when it comes to examining fallacies? How much longer can we afford to look at them as logical mathematical ideas and not see them in their actual bedding sly thinking moves that paved the way for fame and wealth and power. Would this also mean, I know this is a stretch, but I just want, have to put it there, would this also mean that the unsmeared philosopher is complicit in war because they have the wherewithal and the responsibility that stems from a very particular legacy to engage in precarious liberatory composures, but chooses not to because of a loyalty to an assumption that sublime thinking is abstract and depoliticized. And finally, if one composure is giving one an organic soy chai latte and not conium maculatum variety of hemlock, one might wonder if there is a need to be mindful about the genealogy of the composures and reasonings one has opted for. Thank you. <laughs> so I have, a, I, I think Soline's electricity just went out so i will um uh i think it's yes so i don't know if, if she's there i will ask the two questions that were asked before and linda while Soline comes in i think you um we've talked about the questions before so we can go over them together i would love to hear Soline, are you back or no okay she's not okay so um let me bring uh, Soling's questions. So uh, she has asked university students in philosophy or in the humanities should be aware, aware of the possibility of these attacks, both virtual and in person, as we pursue contentious topics and social justice oriented organizing within academia. This kind of information may fear some students or keep them from pursuing activist work. What advice would you give to students who may face these kinds of issues and how should we go about navigating these as they um, occur? Yeah, I can start with this. If people want to put, put their videos back on, um, we can maybe create a sense of community for the Q&A if you want to, uh, if you can. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, it's an important question. Um, I think that I, I think one thing, and I loved your talk, Nassim, because I think I think you put the question of risk right at the center mm -hmm. of all of our work, and that's one thing I would say is that um, we all do some risk calculations in terms of the area of work we go. If if you go into the subfield of philosophy or critical race or decolonial philosophy you have to calculate the risks of that to your um, likelihood of employment. 
right? And what kind of employment you get. So I think um, I, you, you have to be what, what I, I think all of us think about who work in these um, marginalized subfields or methodologies is the need to be strategic. You need to be strategic about the risks that you take rather than impulsive. Uh, when I wrote my dissertation in the mid 80s, I did not write on feminist epistemology, which was my main interest at the time. I wrote on four white guys. <laughs> Right. And I really loved my, you know, what I was working on. I thought it was great, but I chose, it was, it was in part very much a strategic choice about mm -hmm. the risk that I wanted to take at that point. I had two small children. I needed a job. I needed to support them. Um, and so you figure out strategically how to get into a position to be able, and you know, the situation has changed a lot in the profession in terms of what is risky to work on and what is not. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you think strategically about the risks that you take in the field. Um, adventurism is never a good idea. Social media can sometimes be, you know, very tempting to be impulsive. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I think the issue is not, there's no place in which uh, hardly anybody will be completely free of this network. Mm -hmm. the, but the other, the more, more important thing I think to, to say is that the way in which you manage risk is by helping to build and support a network of people and organizations, both inside a, the academy and outside the academy, um, so that you have their back, you know they will have your back. Um, it, you create a broad coalition. You're not going to agree with everybody in this coalition on every issue, but you can have shared goals. And that, that's mm -hmm. what we really are doing and have to do is to, is to create networks of solidarity and support um, institutionally and extra institutionally to um, manage the risks. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I I absolutely, I'm, I also wanted to say, we have to perhaps um, re-engage with fallacies. We have to sort of create a, a, a new light to study the metaphysics of fallacies as they're, they're, they've been with us for a long time. They've been contributing to smears and they've been dangerous to a liberatory thinking. So um, I suffered a lot, but I, I think Linda, you're absolutely right. I have, I had my publications. I had my, my role at, at PES. I was the chair of the committee on the status of women. I was the, I uh, created the decolonial studies SIG. So I had, even though I didn't have a tenured position, but I had some sort of ground to stand on. Otherwise, otherwise it would have wiped me away. So yes, be strategic. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is that I was writing on white guys too, on Heidegger and Levinas and Derrida and no one, like I was receiving respect from the Iranian community. It was the minute I touched on pink washing that everything suddenly changed. So yes, I agree. Um, you have, without having a ground, it's, it's almost, um, it's evident that you're gonna lose this war. Mm -hmm. uh, Celine, I think Professor Morris has a question, but and he wants, he wants to leave, so. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll um, let him speak. I just have wanted to say, well, I'll, I'll say this later. Um, it was about the, it's about the recording. Just say, okay. because the electricity went out, the recording stopped for a minute. It's okay, I have it, don't worry. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, Dr. Morris. It's not, it's not that I want to leave, it's, it's that I have to leave. I'd rather <laughs> be here. Um, <clears throat> but what I, I sort of, uh, I wanted to hear more from the two of you together speaking on this point about temporality, which seemed to be sort of deep down at the bottom of both papers. Mm -hmm. And one thought I had after hearing Nassim's talk, in particular in relation to Socrates and the Sophists, that analysis sort of struck me as two different versions of philosophy. One that would be more, you know, winning arguments for all time, on the basis of concepts and methodologies that have been institutionalized and can be reiterated mm -hmm. in order to trump arguments and so on and so forth. And that's a kind of um, war model in some ways. 
or mm -hmm. at least it is at its worst. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, philosophy as more the, uh, I'm not even beginning to do it until I've been stunned and I'm discombobulated and disoriented. Mm -hmm. um, so philosophy then is a kind of open-ended enterprise mm -hmm. where you know that it can never be one because you know that you will never have succeeded in securing the terms. Mm -hmm. And so it's open-ended in something like the sense of democracy in, in Derrida, let's say. And mm -hmm. if you don't get that, then... And so those, those seem to be two very different temporalities, but then I wanted, or I was sensing a link to the point about um, risk and vulnerability. So like, it seems like if you're doing that second one, uh, a sort of a condition of a possibility of that is risk um, and, and a kind of vulnerability. So you can't escape it. But then I guess the, like, I, I wanted to hear more your thoughts about this point, temporality, vulnerability, openness, because it seems you understand this um, from deep resources that I don't have. And <laughs> secondly, doesn't, like that calls for a different, like then it, you couldn't do philosophy without a community to have your back, um, but also in this tricky way that they might have to say, and you're wrong, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. or something like that. So mm -hmm. sure, we're all in the same boat and it's uh, got a <laughs> hole in the bottom. <laughs> You want to start, Nassim? Go ahead, Linda. It's fine. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's so much there, David. I, I think um, you're getting at this, you know, the war has been a, a model of doing philosophy um, for many philosophers, the agonistic model of, of um, engaging in a kind of disputation and then the in the Middle Ages, of course, that was the meaning of truth. Truth is whoever wins the disputation. Um, and it's, it, you know, so there's been a way in which I think philosophy, um, the history of, of Anglo-American European philosophy has has had, um, probably Nassim could theorize this, um, um, a kind of hypocrisy to put it negatively, about the transcendental universal plane on which we operate. And on the other hand, <laughs> the very uh, located social engagement that we're often trying to do. We're often trying to do critical social analysis very specifically in a very specific space. And we're trying to win against a very concrete opposition. Um, so I think the, the um, the virtue of the agonistic model is its contextualism. Uh, and I think post-Hegelian epistemology um, supports this. So the idea of po in post-Hegelian epistemology is the argument is the, the, the argument that wins is the one that is better than the existing pre previous alternative, rather than the argument that wins is, is is good in an absolute transcendental sense. So I think we really need to contextualize, learn from, I don't always agree with the agonistic model, but, um, but we need to contextualize what we're doing in philosophy and understand it. And I think the concept of opaque meanings as, as Nassim develops, it helps us think about what are the meanings that are operating in this space? Um, what would help us to clarify and to oppose certain meanings that are operating in this space. We need a very concrete, located, contextual approach to that. Um, we can't think about, well, what is the real meaning of the human? I, I, don't, I don't think that question makes sense. We need to think about what has been the meaning of the human here, 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 and here. What are its effects? How would we argue for one rather than another? But, but I think a lot of analytic philosophy is very resistant to contextualism. They don't know how to do it. They don't, you know, what, what does it mean for the methodology? So I think it's a, uh, it, th there's a challenge. And, it, you know, people, it's really hard to get people to retool from, especially tenured professors, from, <laughs> from what they learned in graduate school. You know, we're asking them to retool in a way when we ask them to think about um, opaque concepts and um, contextual meanings and and so forth. Um, so that's that's what I was thinking. And I think um, the we absolutely need networks of solidarity, networks of support that also make it possible to have meaningful 
disagreement agonistics. That's part of the point. The Caribbean Philosophy Association was created uh, not so that we could go and have a safe space where everybody likes everything, but so you could have you could have productive critique, right? <laughs> Rather than the unproductive critique, which we get sometimes in larger organizations. So you want productive engagement where people at least understand what you're doing, it, you know, have some some assumptions shared, and then you can then you can really get useful conversation and useful disagreement to help you develop your ideas in a, in a better way. So it's not about um, not, not having uh, critical engagement, but, but productive critical engagement and, and, and a safe space where we can define that safe space intellectually as well as physically. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, thanks, Professor Maurice, for being here. I'm excited to see you. Um, for me, I, I, I wanna look at it in a different, perhaps a different way um you know it, it's um i'm i first of all i have to say from from the classical dialogues i love the aporias the ones that actually end in confusion there are no moments of that um, there are no the, the 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 confusion is the moment of clarity and i think that's the eastern person in me that sort of um has a problem with placing ignorance or not knowing uh, at the beginning of seeking knowledge in a very linear way, that sort of leads to the idea of, you know, knowing then would be domination and power. So like for me, the place of ignorance is not at the beginning. It's actually in the end where you feel, all right, I do not know about this after you have sort of examined the stuff. Um, I always tell this to my students. We were one time talking about how, you know, the, the benefits of, of modernity and, you know, certainty is important and how it's liberatory um, to have clarity. It's very liberating to, to name stuff and, and, you know, feel that there's a problem with it. But I always tell them that, you know, let's put the limit in harm. If our clarity and certainty harms other people, then that's probably where we should stop with the clarity and, and be mindful of ambiguity. And an example I give is with, you know, I say, um, I, I have, if you look at the history of, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not in gender studies, I'm, I'm not, I, I am in no way uh, well read in it, but um, I have a feeling that it was this quest for clarity that created transphobia and homophobia, like make your choice, like I need to know whether you are this or that. And this is no, it doesn't come in short of an ignorance for me. So that's why like, I, I have a problem with uh, placing ignorance towards the end as a failure. Like this for me is a very sort of Aristotelian looking at, at knowing. So um, if that answers your question. Oh, it was a great answer. Uh, and I think I agree with you about <laughs> It's not until people get confused in class that yeah. Yeah, they yeah, understand yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much both for the talk. I have yeah. to uh, thank you for being take here. A leave. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Okay. Um, so I can go ahead. Here. So it doesn't, um, again, if anyone, I mean, I think at this point, if anyone has a, um, a question for either or both, I have, okay, I have a question that I'm going to read out for, um, for you, Nassim. Could you say more about your choice of the, of the term anonymity and what you think it adds to existing ways of describing the problem with universalizing concepts such as human rights? Yeah, anonymity is basically this idea of, for, for me, uh, uh, let me give you, uh, let me give you a little bit of, um, no, because my, my one of one of my committee members, Clarence, is here, and we're we're just chatting about this idea of Levinas. But um, anonymity. I'm not going to get to I'm not going to get to Levinas. But uh, the the way I, I I wanted to avoid using the word universalism or idealism. Um, that's because it seems like we're desensitized to the harms of these two words because they've been kind of overused here and there. When you say like this universal idea of human rights it really looks innocent and it is and oftentimes like we we need that basis but the reason why i came up with anonymity it's because when you say uh oh 
Interesting. When you say um, he, uh, human rights, like um, the U.S. wants to impose sanctions in the name of human rights, it is an anonymous use of human sanction, human rights use, because the person who is imposing the sanctions is itself standing on unceded territories and unoccupied territories. So if we sort of bring down this idea of human rights from its applicability with its, its seeming the in, seeming innocence and applica applicability to its very particular the background uh, to the context then we will be able to see that it's no longer just an innocent liberatory idea and it can have a certain history and politics behind it so this is what i mean by anonymity um, another thing is what i really like is simon critchley's idea of how um, in some philosophers there is this depoliticized um, concepts and depoliticized concepts they don't go back and, and I like this and I refer to anonymity because he says that these are this goes back to the Judeo-Christian tradition of thinking where you say you know um, everybody is my friend nobody is my enemy uh, and we sort of carry this as if it's an innocent idea when when geopolitics are involved. So when you say, uh, you know, and uh, human rights are imposing sanctions for the sake of freedom, when you sort of contextualize it in the geopolitical reality, suddenly it's no longer this innocent anonymous idea, but it's actually very guilty in having killed a lot of people. So that's what I mean by anonymity. Mm. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> Um, I have another question. I'm waiting to see if the person would like me to read it or if they would like to read it out loud. Um, otherwise, I think I'll this is, oh, oops, sorry, I sent a link. I think uh, there is a question for Linda now. Okay. Um, what do you think of moral philosophers like Michel Ignatieff, who is who are explicitly theorizing aggression against the other and imperial wars? I don't know. I don't know this philosopher. I don't know if Linda does. I thought it's Michel Foucault, so but like that's for Linda. <laughs> I saw there's a different family. No, it was said that it was for the the person uh, who wrote it wrote for Nassim. Oh, okay. I thought I, I thought it was more yours in your bailiwick. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know this philosopher. Uh, on, honestly. Um, uh, I don't know. We have to question the anonymity in the in the presence of theorizing aggression against the other imperial wars in his theories. I would say um, I, I have a thing against right. Like I, I used to, I used to be comfortable with innocence of concepts, and now um, seeing the harm that they're doing, and especially one of the benefits of the Trump administration was that they were so bad at doing what they were doing that it exposed a lot of the pro a lot of the like darkness and denseness of their uh, acts against other people so um i would question i would question the abstract and depoliticized notion and when i say depoliticized means like it's been stripped off of it um you know bergson has a very uh, I, I love i love the phrase he uses um, he says we have abstractions, which means you are stripping concepts and phenomena of their um, characteristics. And this is what happens with concepts uh, of human rights and freedom, uh, like war for freedom. You strip them off of their characteristics, which are for smoother access to resources and etc. And you only focus on the trajectory they want you to see, which is the human rights abuses of the government, which is true. So, you know, this is how I sort of question, I would question theorizing aggression against the other. <laughs> yeah, and if I can add to that, I think um, it, that is the limitations for a lot of us with, with theorizing from Levinas and Agamben, for example, although there's tremendous resources in both Levinas and Agamben that are quite useful, but there's a limitation in the sense that the characterization of the other or of the um, person who's in the camps, stripped of history, social identity of any sort. So you can't really get an explanation from either Agamben or Levinas or other approaches in this way about why those specific people are in the camps, right? Why those specific people are the targets of colonial violence or, or gendered violence. 
Um, and, you know, and that's why we have to, uh, I think, um, put it in, in the historical context uh, rather than the human in this generic. And I think the other problem that that generic approach to injustice toward the other does is it lends itself to arguments of reverse discrimination of white settlers losing their rights and their power you know and you take you take white property owning settlers completely outside of context and you can form formalistically see a um an analogy with other groups but it it doesn't work in reality because um that's not the way injustice is working mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't help us explain go ahead Oh, I am the person who asked the previous question, and I know that you want to see my face, but um, I show you for a second because behind me you will see a room disoriented. <laughs> so yeah, here you are. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Work. Yeah. Hello, this is me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I um, Michael Ignatieff is the leader of the. Uh, was the leader of Liberal Party of Canada, and he is a professor of moral philosophy at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And the book that he wrote at uh, on time for the purposes, uh, and it was very explicit about uh, the topic of the book is the lesser evil. And uh, he was one of the Bush's team. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, my question uh, is that like in uh, in the formulation that Nassim does about opacity and uh, the role of uh, you know philosophy i think uh, there is a you know there are philosophers who are actually explicitly in the war machine mm -hmm. and how do you put them in your yeah. classification so I, I really really think that they are that's what i'm saying they're relying on the opacity and anonymity of concepts to justify something philosophically this is this is my take, um, and I also wanted to mention, in addition to um, uh, Linda's uh, talk about Levinas, it's not that Levinas doesn't provide answers. Levinas actually justifies um, the subordination or the subordinated subordinated look at the non-Judeo-Christian and non-Greco-centric world. Literally, like the theor the theorist of alterity has a justification for reducing the Western, the non-Western to the exotic and dance. And when he says, you know, and I've said this before and we've had our fights with, with Clarence that he says, and he says, I often say this, but often repeat it. Like I often say this, even though it's dangerous to mention it publicly. So it's not a side comment. I'm not trying to be picky on Levinas. I love Levinas, but he says that, um, that humanity consists of the Bible and the Greeks. All the rest is translatable. All the rest is dance. And then, you know, the idea of, of that, um, it just confuses me beyond words. Like I, I get angry. I, I, I don't know how to deal with this, uh, this take from someone who's theorizing alterity in that much of nuance when it comes to the internal, uh, the internal other of Europe, but it, when it gets to the external outside of this Bible belt, um, things will change. Um, and I've, I've, I've problematized that. Um, and I've sort of ascribed how he's looking at two different notions of time and two different notions of alterity because he's still adhering to a traditional concept of time, even though he says he's not. Uh, but Clarence rejected my paper at PES, so um, I have to fix it again. <laughs> But anyways, I just wanted to say that um, uh, that's that's where um, continental philosophy falls short, and I think it goes back to Professor Morris's comment about the place of knowledge and ignorance um, that I have problems with. Uh, but that's it. Wonderful. So we have three questions right now. We have first question from Clarence. Uh, who will say it out loud. And then I have two anonymous questions. Just really quickly, if anyone has any more questions that they would like to submit, please put them in the chat now. Uh, it, we're down to our last 20 or so minutes. Sure. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I Hi, I just want to say first, uh, such a wonderful session. And I, when I saw the two of you on this panel, I go, I got to watch this. I got to come to it. I was looking, I've never heard you, Linda, talk. Uh, 
I've read your work, but so I'm really pleased to see you. And Nassim and I go pretty far back. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about Levinas, Nassim. Uh, you know, we, we can have that discussion uh, again more often uh, elsewhere. Um, I love the idea of uh, opacity and anonymity as opposed to universality. I think it names something beyond just the innocence of universality. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, uh, it made me think, and you don't have to, if you don't, you know, you don't have to comment on it, but it reminded me that what's, what's happening that universality doesn't name is the circulation of power, like Foucault's idea of of circulation of power or knowledge power put together. Like we usually think of concepts as meanings, which are innocent of power, but in fact, they're not, right? And so the, so the universality hides that particular circulation all the time. And I think that that's what you're, mm -hmm. that you're actually exactly. getting towards. Absolutely, yes, exactly. No, no, that's, that's true. That's absolutely true. Thank you. I love, I love that. <laughs> Celine. I have a few, I lost right. um, So I will go ahead and read um, the two, oh, well, I will read the first and then the second anonymized question. Um, and then if we have time, I would like to ask my own question. All right, so uh, this is the first one of the two. What contribution and or limitations does ideology expressed in art forms such as poetry, music, and film bring in when exploring concepts revolving around human rights, given that they occupy a liminal position within the spectrum of abstract or depoliticized content concepts and concrete activism. Linda, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I think that um, we need to do an analysis of the sort of visual infrastructure, material infrastructure. Uh, I'm working with a, a colleague now on thinking through the, the image of the witch and the cannibal to link the, the image of the witch in, in Europe, um, you know, from the 14th and 17th centuries. Uh, co, you know, very much uh, coterminous with the time frame of the colonization of the the New World, quote unquote, and the emergence of this image of the cannibal, um, and and the ways in which these images of of the female um, abject inform each other and uh, uh, work together in both locations differentially but to some extent offering mutual support. We need to, you know, philosophers generally don't have the capacity to do philosophical analysis in re relationship to images and um, mm -hmm. art, uh, except for some, some, not all, some <laughs> folks who work in aesthetics. But we need to include that, certainly when we want to talk about resistance and change is our, our um, material infrastructure, our, our visual surroundings, which mm -hmm. convey meanings, convey ideas uh, more powerfully than our words do, and uh, are seen as subject to you know, absolute inviolability. If you critique them, you're importing politics, you're importing censorship, and the reality is they're embedded within our political uh, lives. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to. I'm 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 a bit evil. I wanted to think um, before, and then I said, Linda can go ahead. But I just want to say, you know, you guys like in arts, you can undo opacities way better than we do. So just like do it with respect to, especially geopolitics of knowledge and what you know um Enrique Dussel talks about um you know his his work is a fantastic way to start thinking about undoing these opacities um uh, in especially philosophy of liberation the way the, the place philosophy was born and the way it was born um I think they can be great allies in uh, to philosophy because you you guys have a better like art, people in art have like e they get easier passes because you know it doesn't go through these all these gatekeeping um measures so yeah undo the opacity unbreak our hearts with that are broken with war. <laughs> but anyways. Sweet. 
So there's now another, there are two questions now. I have one anonymous, and then I have a question from Sean, who will say that out loud. Uh, so the the question, the, the anonymous question is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, Nassim, it's for you, because uh, it's focused on Socrates. Um, was Socrates still victim to this complex opacity since he technically ends up respecting the, convic the convi conviction sorry, and refuses the chance to escape in the credo? Was he rendered complacent? Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that because, um, and that's a good question because I know there, I read a lot about this, how he could have escaped and then he didn't and then he's decided to um, stay and you know follow the law. I, I, I really don't have an answer. The, the main part of uh, Socrates' work that I kept thinking about uh, in, was the, 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 the how, how the, and the, the, the type of smears that he went through because he was trying to arrange meanings in a way that it would be impossible to see things like before. Um, this is this is what this was my, my main preoccupation with Socrates, especially with Theotetus's uh, dialogue in the Aporias, not the other ones. So um, I agree that is an interesting point to think about, but I don't have an answer for it. Thank you. And I think we'll have Sean. Uh, Sean will be the last question. Um, and then we're going to conclude the, the talk. So Sean, go ahead. So much pressure. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for this talk. I must say I, I was late because of a prior commitment. So I'm sorry if this question is redundant or reductive. But my question is more, um, I suppose, like political in that I'm wondering if you two have any thoughts on how exactly philosophers should work strategically to undo the prevailing commonsensical notion that um, concepts are and should be unmoored from politics. I'm thinking in particular because like, you know, I myself uh, work in Foucault and when I talk with other Foucauldians, this is already, you know, like commonsensical for us, but I still find that when I speak to non-Foucauldians, for instance, there's a lot of resistance to this notion mm -hmm. and it's especially evidenced in like, I think still um, contemporary analytic epistemology conferences you know, be, like last year I attended a keynote for an epistemology conference and at the end of the keynote um, where the, the keynote was just trying to like begin to make the argument for doing something that Foucault does, which is to like link power knowledge in the disciplinary, um, uh, in the disciplinary context of analytic philosophy. And there was like a resounding rejection from the audience on this notion and a lot of people at the conference continue to hold fast to this really strict division between epistemology and politics and so on. So I was, I was just curious if you have any like particular ideas for like, you know, mobilizing against these conceptions, like sh for instance, should there be like counter smear campaigns or like what, what would this look like? I'm uh, sorry if this is too general. Thank you. <laughs> I love counter smear campaigns. Linda, go ahead. I don't, I'm not a Foucauldian, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think there's warring methodology in the profession of philosophy, and there probably always will be, but I do think we can do a political analysis of which methodologies are dominant and the ways in which the war, the, the um, conflicts get represented. Um, and so I think what we have to do is what we do is like creating panels like this, um, uh, uh, insisting on pluralism and department curricula. It's an ongoing fight. And I feel like continental philosophy has lost a lot of ground in my time in the profession. But there, uh, it's still the case that continental philosophers are very influential, widely read, read out, you know, in philosophy and outside of philosophy. So the work is remaining important and influential, mm -hmm. um, even though many of the top research departments are um, becoming, I think, more exclusivist uh, and, and, and rejecting continental philosophy. So I, I think, um, you know, just doing, doing the, the work that we're doing, but also thinking strategically about how to maintain, you know, University of Montreal has had a long tradition and Concordia of, you know, having some pluralism in, in the philosophy department and, and fighting to maintain that and seeing that is philosophically important to do. Um, 
I think is, I, I don't, I don't think, you know, counter smear campaigns. I mean, but it's, it's just, I mean, what we've been doing is, is, is Nassim's paper in particular is offering a very sharp critique of the, uh, of, of what's at stake in um, these methodologies that sanction um, anonymity and, and, and universality and so forth. And it's, it's, n it's not, you know, and, and working on two fronts, showing what politically is at stake with these particular wrong ideas and showing how philosophically weak they are and philosophically mistaken they are. I think we have to make both kinds of arguments. Obviously, they are integrated arguments and i think what you know what the the what foucault is so useful for is when you you trace out the relations between power and knowledge in any given that should give you ca cause to think further right that should give that should be um a motivation to look at um as he as he shows um you know what, what are what is the what is the philosophical work that these institutional connections are doing for the supremacy of a concept or or an, an approach, right? So how how is this operating within um, philosophical argumentation? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a story to tell there. Can I add something just to Linda's? Um, and I, I agree. I, I counter smears. I was thinking doing phenomenology of these. Um, harms that we've gone through is an act of a counter smear. Like it's uh, not talking about it, you know, stop it at that, that, that point, but actually committing to discussing the difficult um, discussions would, would act as a counter smear. Although I, I the, the help I've received from allies online, Barzin is one of them, he's online right now. They, it's, it's been really helpful. Um, my, my colleagues at Concordia, although I had to explain forever, like, you know, that I'm not an apologist and everything, but I'm, I had to articulate arguments in a way that, you know, a non, a brown person would understand. Um, Alliance is incredibly important. Um, if I didn't have Linda, I wouldn't have given this talk. We, you know, I said, we need to, we need to talk about this. And I also want to mention one thing, because um, I wrote, I saw this, I, I haven't read James Baldwin, but I saw this quote that the victim who's able to articulate the situation of the victim has ceased to be a victim and they have become a threat. So in that light, I see doing a phenomenology of smear campaigns and doing a phenomenology of even fallacies um, can become, can be along the lines of liberatory critique and therefore useful to, to us. So, you know, I, I wanted to acknowledge that. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think that is going to be it for tonight. Um, I would like to thank both of our speakers and for everyone who has joined us this evening and has persevered against the Zoom fatigue uh, <laughs> that is just incessant and, uh, you know, thank worse you, than worse than. Um, so I don't know if you have any last words, um, Dr. Alkoff or Professor Neroz, you want to add? Thank you so much. Just I'm, I'm grateful to you all. Thank you very much for listening. And thanks, Linda, for being here again. Well, I know, Celine, you had also asked about what institutions can do. And I do think that we should urge our institutions, both our universities and our organizations like Philosophy of Education Society to take a public stand on, on some of these um, smears and, you know, a public stand that are going against the harassers um, and of resistance rather than, they should not hide behind neutrality. They should come out and make public stands of support. Um, and, and, and they can, and they can do that, and they should. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again uh, to everyone who joined. Um, and uh, this recording will be posted um, and so we will be able to circulate this. I'll likely send uh, uh, the recording, the, a link to the YouTube on um, to the all the emails who are signed up for the Zoom uh, conference. And so uh, that way you'll have access to it. Um, thank you all again for coming. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.
Thanks, Celine, Thank for you. everything. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Linda. Bye. Bye. Bye.